<laughs> my name is TJ Myhill. I'm a business technology and IP litigator here in Atlanta, Georgia with Stites and Harbison in our Atlanta office. Uh, and I handle legal issues and litigation issues relating to uh, these types of, of questions fairly routinely. My name is uh, Kurt Opsall. I am Associate General Counsel for Cybersecurity and Civil Liberties Policy at the Filecoin Foundation, also a special counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, and I've been working in the internet and technology space since the as the 90s. Uh, so I've been around uh, for, for these kinds of issues that uh, affect the uh, those who host content for others for a very long time. Uh, so I've got, uh, first of all, thank you for coming in person. And also thank you for everyone who's uh, watching this video for coming around and watching it later. Um, and so yeah, I think I'll just give uh, start out with a bit of a, an overview. Um, when you're when you're hosting material, for others, uh, messages, images, things like that it could be on a Mastodon server. It could be this. This is framed as a, a discussion about Mastodon, but a lot of the legal issues are the same. If you're running any kind of service that is hosting things for for other people, and sometimes they, yeah, they put some information that late raises legal issues. Uh, the good news is in most jurisdictions, there are protections for these intermediaries. So uh, law and policy generally recognize that the soapbox is not liable for what the speaker has said. Uh, things uh, got more complex as the internet uh, grew. For a long time, a lot of information was being conveyed by uh, traditional services, wireline services like you know, the phone. And no one seriously thought the phone company was liable if someone used a phone to like harass somebody. Uh, harassing phone calls were, were an issue for a while, uh, but no one seriously thought that, that the phone company was liable. But as more and more content got hosted up, and policymakers started to look to the service providers to help solve the problem. And uh, mostly to the larger service providers, so some, some obligations do not reach the smaller ones. So um, what, what is the purpose of this? Why is it important? Limited uh, liability limitations help innovation and development. The users benefit from having these third-party services. Um, it is hard for providers to scale gatekeeping. And that is essentially one of the things that is, is being asked by the policymakers. There is the, the cost of review and analysis and, and decisions, and these will often exceed the revenue. So like if you are running a, a short messaging service like Mastodon, uh, your revenue may be anything from nothing to fractions of a, of a penny for a given post. The cost of thinking about it, about whether it is a problem, will far exceed any possible revenue. And the, the challenge with that, sort of the, the policy issue with that, is that incentivizes people to take things down. Uh, that the cost of compliance being so high, if there's any whiff of trouble, remove it. Uh, so it's an incentive to be cautious and remove it the first time of trouble if you might be liable for what somebody has said. So legal protections for liability are critical for maintaining and encouraging a space in which people can post things without it having to have an initial review, without it being costly, without having a compliance team being one of the first hires at a startup. Um, so the policymakers look at competing interests, processes for innovation and economic development. Uh, and they want, also are tempted to use the threat of liability, even though it will th slow innovation, investment, and growth because of its benefits in preventing harm. So it provides that and the liability incentive, provide that incentive for the areas to stop or remove the harmful content the policymakers want to be taken down. And they're balancing that against uh, free expression, or at least in countries where free expression is a, is a tradition. Uh, and some, but not all, jurisdictions want to enable a space for unfettered discussion and debate, but others want to maximize control. And I'm talking more globally here. If you're running a internet service, there's quite a possibility that you might have uh, customers from, from all over the world, and then you get into some jurisdiction problems we're going to touch base on a little bit. So the policymakers have a very easy to state goal and a very hard to achieve one. Stop the bad and allow the good. And they may vary on what bad and good are, but like, yeah, see, it's easy. You just stop the bad. Uh, but it is very hard in practice. And there's and there, 
very tough questions about what is good, what is allowable. Uh, a, a phrase uh, sometimes used, a, a quip about it, is lawful but awful. There is a lot of uh, content out there that under uh, especially uh, American principles of free expression, which are very strong, that is lawful, but it still is uh, something that many people will dislike or be offended by, uh, that are, is challenging. And so that's sort of a category of lawful but awful. Um, and um, a further question that policymakers have to deal with is who is bearing the burden, the burden of detecting what is the bad speech, determining whether it is in fact too bad, and then uh, if done well, that might have some due process in it, a uh, process to determine whether this is being done fairly, and then you might have a removal, but if you have a removal, adding in a putback procedure, uh, and then finally uh, redressing any, any harm. So, uh, and just the areas that the law looks at the most, um, one is uh, privacy, uh, data protection. That is a much larger issue uh, outside the United States. Many countries, uh, the majority of them, I think 70, 70 plus percent of countries have data protection laws uh, at a national scale. Uh, in the United States, there is no uh, national comprehensive data protection law. There's a number of states which have uh, data protection laws or privacy laws. There are a, uh, a set of privacy laws at a national level that are subject uh, specific. So uh, you may have heard of HIPAA, which is health information. Uh, there's also the you know, Video Privacy Protection Act, which is specific to uh, information about what videos you watch, but not a general one. Beyond privacy, um, there is intellectual property, especially copyright comes up a lot in the internet content. If somebody is using someone else's IP, which brings up issues of whether that's a fair use. Uh, and then speech and content issues. Could be unlawful uh, content, it's pretty much uh, agreed uh, uh, throughout the world that uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material, is unlawful and cannot be uh, posted, but then there might be a lot of other content that could be harmful or could be a, a social issue. Uh, this comes up a lot in the case of lawful uh, adult content, which may be unlawful for children. Um, so, well, I think... Uh, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll go into uh, some of these issues in greater detail, but I guess I'll, I'll talk about some of some of the liability issues you're familiar with. Sure. Well, first off, let's start. Well, let's start with a baseline, right? Mastodon is not like Discord. Uh, it's not like Twitter. It's not like any of the other services where you get to host something but not contain the the, the liability. When you're directly hosting the material on your direct equipment you're the one who stands in the shoes of the isp it has to come in and, and, and take that so the first thing the first thing that i recommend before we even talk about how you comply or what you need to do is it shouldn't be you complying it should be your business complying because just like everybody else that i mentioned previously has a has a business to handle this so should you so that when someone hires me to come sue you for something that you maybe did wrong, I'm suing your LLC and not you personally, and I'm going to take your LLC assets if there are any, and not your car and your house and your bank account. So definitely form a company up front and have that company host your server. Beyond that, the 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 questions of what you do and don't do. You just heard Kurt's list, and that's not even the comprehensive. There's, there's, there's myriad things that you need to comply with. Some of them are going to be esoteric enough, and your server is going to be small enough that you don't really have to worry about it. You should worry about it because it could hit you. But um, you know, some of these things you should be aware of the compliance. And sometimes we just balance the risk and say it's too much burden to deal with that. I don't want to do it. But some of the ones that that you have to deal with directly are you got to deal with privacy issues if you're going to have if you're going to have a server you need to make a terms of service and you need to make sure that it's got privacy issues in it your terms of service needs to have what's going to happen if we comply if, if we find infringing materials copyright so i know y'all are at 
the EF forums tracks, you're all roughly familiar with Section 230. We'll, we'll talk about that. But people forget that Section 230 expressly doesn't deal with intellectual property. So while Section 230 has kind of a blanket perfect protection for ISPs that you don't really have to opt into, the Copyright Act, in order to be immune from any infringing materials posted on your Excuse me, posted on your server, you have to be affirmatively opting in to that, to that protection. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act is what provides the protection, and it requires you to designate an agent to receive information. If you don't designate and identify that, in, that agent, you don't have that protection, and now you're liable for the copyright infringing material that's on your site. Once you have that agent, that agent has to be aware of any incoming mail and then and receive takedown notices. That agent has to properly comply with proper takedown notices. That agent has to properly comply with proper putback notices. As long as you do those things, then you are in fact immune from any liability. But but unlike some of the other areas of law, where as long as you set something up in advance or you just fall under certain umbrellas, you have to actively take that role. It can be a pretty easy role. You receive the put the, the takedown notice. You look it over, make sure that it complies with the requirements. You take down the material. But we've had case law recently that suggests that copyright owners filing a DMCA takedown should decide whether this is fair use. But there's some suggestion that the ISP should also look to identify whether it is fair use before they take down what would otherwise be legitimate material. Now, I've been talking about fair use for 20 plus years. And the thing I always remind everyone is that fair use is a defense that you raise in court. And the only person who can actually tell you if that's for sure or for definite fair use is the judge or the jury. So at the end of the day, that's a hard call to make. And if you get it wrong, maybe you didn't take down something that is actually infringing. Maybe you did take down something that wasn't. If you're a small company, generally err on the side of the takedown process. If you get a put back, put it back. But also be aware that there are people who are misusing the DMCA system, just like any of these other services, to say that you know there's a there's a requirement in the DMCA that says that you have you have to ban repeat offenders, three strikes, five strikes, whatever you have selected as your threshold of repeat. But some people will just spam takedown notices on uh, uh, on an ex partner or you know someone they're they're trying to to harass to force people to take down their 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 social media accounts. So in that instance, do you pay attention to that? Do you do you weigh that out? Do you not? This is where having a you know a smaller server where it's maybe just you running the whole thing instead of a team of professionals handling this like Twitter has. Then that that creates a hard balance. Well, bad, yeah, uh, that creates a, a a a harder balance. So some of these things that you're going to have to do are there's there's going to be a bit of a, a weight and balance of is it worth is it worth complying with this law? And if I don't want to comply with this law, is it worth allowing people to post content on my server? So let me, uh, yeah, add add on yes, yes, and on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the DMCA, I think one of the a very important takeaway from what TJ has said is that uh, you don't get the protection at all if you have not registered the agent. So like that is something that anyone operating an online service uh, should do because uh, it's the threshold that that is is required. Also, uh, having a policy on inappropriate circumstances to remove. Uh, re repeat infringers is a requirement, and so that's something that should be in a, a in a written policy on on the site. It could be in the terms of use. Use it could be in a separate copyright policy. Some people have a different section for the DMCA uh, copyright policy. Um, on on what you do when you receive uh, a DMCA policy, I definitely understand that like you know it can be. In fact, there's a lot of incentives 
to not try to figure out whether this is a fair use. I would say, you know, while I, you know, ultimately a court will decide, nevertheless, there are circumstances in which it might be an obvious fair use. Yes, for sure. Uh, and this might be in those harassment kinds of circumstances, and yes, people will abuse it. Uh, if someone abuses the DMCA, uh, mis misrepresentations in a DMCA notice uh, can lead to liability by the person who sent in the notice. But I, you know, the, the person who sent it in, uh, especially if it's an harassment server, they may be judgment proof. It may not be a you know a, a viable thing to to go after them. Um, and then it, some of it may depend on what kind of site and what kind of audience that you have. Whether it is important to your business model to be seen as a, a brave and strong site that's willing to stand up, uh, or whether uh, you want to have a a fr friendly place that uh, uh, you know takes takes things down and just uh, everyone should have uh, a, a level of content they would expect uh, uh, to be non-controversial. And if you are one of the places that is trying to make an image of a, you know, a brave and strong site, then, you know, spending some time to figure out whether you really need to take it down might be good for like presenting that business model at the cost of having to figure that out and, and take some some risk if you're if you're wrong uh, and you know you can also uh, encourage somebody to counter notice so if you get a DMC notice and you send that out to the user the user has the option to counter notice and say no no this is a fair use it's not infringing uh, this is actually my copyright all the things that they might say that that would say that uh, by one of the, one of the more common scenarios that that comes up when uh, is someone might uh, send a DMCA notice claiming copyright in a picture of them uh, and not not a selfie. Uh, and if you don't take the picture, the picture the copyright belongs to the person who took the picture. Yeah, you can have, you know hire someone to do it and, and be work made for hire and there's scenarios but a lot of people were using it as a proxy for a privacy issue uh but they don't actually own the own the copyright and if you don't own the copyright then it's not a good dmca notice uh, and that might be one for pushback but in any event you send it on to the user and you can encourage the user to uh do a counter notice and if they do the counter notice then you can put it right back up uh and uh still maintain the safe harbor and and liability protections uh, the electronic frontier foundation has some information about how to do a counter notice so you could even point them to that information and say here you know if you think a counter notice is appropriate here is a place where you can learn uh, all the elements that you need to put into it and uh, make sure they have a properly formatted counter notice. Uh, and then I wanted to to loop back to to section 230 to to make the the contrast there. Right. So DMCA is a notice and takedown system. So if you all is good until you receive notice and then you have to take it down or you get the counter notice or or, or what have you or you're getting liability. 230 is a immunity. So even if you get notice that something that a user has posted is a problem, and it is in fact a problem, that does not mean that you have to take it down, uh, though you may want to take it down pursuant to your content moderation. And I think we can get into some of the content moderation issues in a, in a, in a moment. But uh, for, for Section 230, it is... Is a pretty amazing law. Uh, it passed uh, in uh, 1996 as part of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, so it's often called Section 230 of the CDA. Communications Decency Act was a uh, attempt in the, in the beginnings of the popularization of the internet to make it a nice, decent place for families, um, which uh, was, as it turns out, unconstitutional. That this new mode of communication could not be. Uh, you know, removed of lawful uh, uh, protected speech, uh, just because people wanted to make sure the internet was was decent, and so the CDA, uh, its its provisions that were requiring decency, were struck down by the Supreme Court, ACLU versus Reno in ninety uh, seven, but. Section 230 was also part of it, and that was not struck down. And the idea behind Section 230 was to solve a problem. The problem was that if you were an ISP and you did no moderation whatsoever, and you just put stuff off and didn't touch it at all, then you had greater legal protections. But if an ISP was like, you know what, this is, this is 
maybe lawful content, but it's offensive, it's harassment, I don't want that on my site, I'm going to take it down. Now that you've you know, taken the responsibility of taking down one piece of content, you are now responsible for all of the content. Well, why didn't you take down this other one? Well, why didn't you take down this? And this was a strong disincentive for content moderation. And the uh, uh, Congress uh, realized that that would be a problem. And so uh, they, they uh, tried to make it so that it was more protected to make those decisions by saying that the, the, the sites would not be treated as a publisher. And there's a rare example of this uh, where the policy objectives of the law were actually written into the law. And they have policies, a national policy to preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists in the internet and interactive computer services, unfettered by federal or state regulation. They wanted to encourage the development of technologies, maximize user control of what information received by individuals, families, and schools. It's actually pretty good stuff. Now, of course, this policy statement is not binding in any future con Congress. It is really just a, a way for them to uh, say, say what they cared about, but not binding. But still, that was a, a pretty good policy, and it's what helped develop the internet where it is today. Uh, or, you know, what some people say for, for good or for ill, but nevertheless, it has developed and developed a lot within the United States, in great part because of the existence of uh, 230. Also, as TJ was saying, it is not complete. It does not affect uh, any intellectual, any law pertaining to intellectual property. This has created a some questions like, is a right of publicity law pertaining to intellectual property? Um, and it also has no effect on U.S. federal criminal law. So it has no effect on obscenity or CSAM. Uh, and uh, no effect on privacy law. So, you know, it's, it's incomplete, but it is a, a very powerful tool for anyone running a Mastodon instance or any, any kind of online service. 230 is your friend. Yeah, be very familiar. The, the other thing that um, I'll point out about Section 230, though, is if you look back at some of our last couple of years of, of panels, you'll see that 230 is pretty routinely under attack. Now, without, I, mean, I think, Without Section 230, without the DMCA, we would not have the Internet as we know it today because people would be liable for any tortious or infringing material that was put on their server because you'd be the publisher or the speaker or the person putting it out to the public. There'd, there'd be all kinds of liability if you let random schmucks put stuff on your website. So you wouldn't let people do that. It would, it would have killed the Internet that we know today. So, so the existence of these is foundational, as Kurt said, but it is also the foundation that is being attacked. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have questions, come on, come on, yeah, come to the mic or just, yeah. This is relatively quick because there's a question about the DMCA. Uh, I guess, I guess we're not on. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, okay. There we perfect. go. Yeah. It's a question about ACLU versus Reno mm -hmm. with the current configuration of the court and the, the possibility of them revisiting that and basically overturning ACLU versus Reno and what that would affect would have. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, one of the things that has been challenging over recent years is that uh, the Supreme Court used to have a very strong uh, doctrine that would leave, uh, you know, uh, stare decisis, which is Latin for, you know, it's been decided, and have this doctrine that even if you disagreed with a past decision, well, it's been decided, we don't want to rock the boat too much, and so um, uh, it was rare when, when prior cases were overturned. That doctrine is not as strong these days, which I think is a little bit what you're what you're getting at with the with the question. Um, so that makes it you know more difficult as as a lawyer to say, well, you know, it's been decided, and so that's that's how it's going to be. However, I would say where where I've seen at least in in uh, some of the decisions and some of the dissents of the decisions, like uh, Justice Thomas is is very much uh, wants to change how two thirty works. Uh, that it is going to be more around the edges and, and the margins than it would be just sort of straight up saying uh, the Internet is not protected by freedom of expression. Uh, that uh, on, the, on the whole, the animus has been more about uh, whether the uh, ISPs can be held accountable for uh, 
some of the decisions they make. And uh, so a, a particular 230 thing that came up recently, the Third Circuit just had, had a decision about this, uh, about algorithmic content. So for uh, you know, a lot of the major providers, uh, what you see in your feed is determined by an algorithm. Uh, and so the algorithm uh, looks at what you've done, makes some judgment calls, and sends you some material. Uh, and uh, in this case, it was TikTok. And TikTok uh, had been at a thing that went viral, which was the, I think it was called the Blackout Challenge. And it was that you would do something that would cut off your oxygen to the point where you blacked out. Like, this was a bad idea. A uh, very dangerous thing to do, but nevertheless, it became viral, and people would make these little TikTok videos of them choking themselves, and then you know, uh, I guess putting that triumph on uh, TikTok, uh, and then of course somebody died, and they they sued TikTok for this, uh, and so the Third Circuit decided that the algorithm having chosen to send that video was something for which TikTok could be held liable, uh, even though a lot of the prior decisions on Section 230 said that your editorial decisions, what to take down or what to not take down, were protected by the law. And so this is starting out as a circuit split. Uh, in, in the U.S., there are a number of different circuits. Uh, you know, we're, here, we're in the 11th Circuit here in Georgia. I, I'm California. That's where the 9th Circuit is and so on. Uh, and so you can potentially have in the U.S. different rules in different circuits, and then the Supreme Court resolves that. And I would say it's a, an open question where the Supreme Court will come down on the interpretation of 230. But I don't think that they're likely to just straight up go uh, remove uh, and, and, and ACLU versus Reno. The, the other thing that I want to follow up on on 230 is we, we mentioned that it doesn't cover intellectual property. And I mentioned that in the context of the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The Copyright Office and Congress have a specific provision in place for how you handle uh, infringing materials online. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office does not. Now, that's because it's a whole lot easier to infringe someone's copyright on social media but it is not impossible to to misuse or, or or infringe someone's trademark rights or other rights. And of course, there's other questions of intellectual property, trade secrets, rights of privacy, rights of publicity. None of those actually have a specific program. What a lot of what a lot of sites do is follow the DMCA for that too. They'll provide some information of you can contact me if you think there's your information being infringed, and I will address it appropriately. You know, generally. You follow those rules for copyright and it works for copyright i'm going to do it for the other things too and i'm going to provide a way to take down or provide a notice of your claimed infringement so that's something that is a is a another good tool to have in your toolbox for your terms of use as to whether you're going to be able to take down potentially infringing material with your moderation uh with, with what you're going to moderate now that's again how much you're going to moderate that's that's the question that you need to decide as the person who is now holding the bag on liability for these things. So it's a lot easier to put, pass it off to the big company, but you're the company now. I hope you're a company now. Yeah, and I just uh, to add on to that, for like trademark in particular, uh, comes up a, a bit. Um, under trademark law, you know, trademark is essentially it's a consumer protection statute. It's so that if you, you know, go to the store and ask for a Coke, you're going to get a Coke and not a, not a Pepsi. Maybe you can use the, the brand uh, and you know, become, the ideal is that you become familiar with the qualities of that brand. And thus, by asking for it by name, you get to have something which has those, those qualities. Um, and this also uh, you know, means it is, it is lawful and not a trademark infringement to use a trademark nominatively. Mm -hmm. you know, like say, you know, this is a Coca-Cola. If it is, you know, it is Coca-Cola, like that is totally fine for me to refer to it that way, including things like, you know, I don't like Coca-Cola. Um, but uh, one of the things that sometimes comes up uh, online uh, is people who are uh, trying to sell counterfeit uh, materials, you know, come to my site, get all these Louis Vuitton bags. Uh, and a lot of the online takedowns are about uh, counterfeit goods. 
probably less so uh, on, on Mastodon server. You know, they, this, this comes up most frequently on, you know, people are trying to get it onto marketplaces, eBay, Etsy, uh, these kinds of places which are more oriented toward people who are seeking for something to buy. But that is a trademark issue that may come up on uh, this. Um, but I think that's a, it's a decent segue into uh, like another aspect of the issue, which is content uh, moderation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on, on the legal sense, at least in the U.S., because of 230, there's a lot of protection for your decisions about what you want to do on, on content moderation. Um, but nevertheless, there, there are some legal issues at the, at the margins there. So, um, at, the, at the worst end, you have uh, CSAM, and that is, you know, in all, all instances, unlawful, and it should, if, if some is on a server and you discover it, then to report it to NICMIC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and there's a reporting hotline for that, and remove the material. Uh, and uh, I, it, sometimes uh, you, you can send it to, to, to NICMIC and such, but then a little bit uh, uh, after that. Uh, and hopefully that doesn't come up uh, very, very frequently. Uh, and then we've had a, a, a a slew of laws in the last couple of years that have been proposed or in some cases passed uh, about uh, kids, uh, kids online safety acts. Uh, a lot of them are focused on on privacy, but some of them is also focused on uh, making sure that they get access to adult uh, material. Uh, there are some of these laws are trying to solve for this by having age verification. A reason these things are being challenged by uh, First Amendment advocates uh, is that in order to do effective age verification, uh, you often need to identify everyone who's doing it. So whether so an adult who wants to go see some adult material online might have to, you know, uh, identify themselves, show their uh, driver's license with with its age, and you know, have that go into a database, and that is uh, something that goes against a lot of our uh, free expression principles to uh, your, right, your right to read anonymously is something that has been uh, come up before in the courts and the courts have, have said you, you have this. Uh, uh, so these are intention, but nevertheless, th those are in play. Uh, and also as a decision of what kind of site that you want to have. Um, the, the other sort of uh, related area there uh, for thinking of, of uh, uh, age is that there are privacy laws in the U.S. I said there's not a comprehensive privacy law, but there are specifically one of them is COPPA, uh, the uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, and it has a lot of uh, regulations uh, uh, and requirements for collecting information about children uh, 13 and younger. Uh, and uh, or uh, as you have to comply with these, if either you know that someone is under thirteen or thirteen, or, um, or if you have a site that is directed to children, so if it is judged uh, uh, to be uh, filled with like cartoon animals doing fun kid stuff, but you're like, we don't collect anybody ages, so we could therefore collect all the other information. That would be that would be a problem. An excellent solution to this is to be. Anything that approximates uh, uh, focusing at, at at children, you know, don't don't collect a lot of that information. Or if you really care about privacy, collect as little information as possible, uh, and and get it around it uh, that way. Uh, and then sort of finally to to sort of uh, uh, wrap up on uh, a little bit on the content moderation uh, uh, is making decisions about what you're going to do about lawful but awful materials uh, things which might be harassing or uh, hate speech and there's a common misconception in the uh, among people in the u.s that hate speech is unlawful but in fact it is protected by the uh, the first amendment uh, it may be awful but it is it is lawful it has to go up to a level of uh incitement uh so uh and uh you know incitement to you know uh uh, criminal activities, and not only that, would have to be you know, a imminent uh, unlawful action. So if somebody says, you know, right now, go grab your guns and go over to this person's house and shoot them, that would be you know over over the line. But if you say generally, I think this category of people are terrible people, uh, then that 
would not uh, go over the line, even if somebody read that and took took action. So that's a lot of sites decide that this is not the kind of speech they want to host, even if it is lawful. So one quick nuance on the on the CSAM thing. Um, I do want to, uh, Gert is absolutely right, obviously, if there's anything that, that's on your site, report it to Nick Mick, take it down. But take it down from the public facing sites. Some of the statutes require you to preserve data about that post and specifically about the poster and other and other things that could, could assist in identifying the, the source of materials so, so that law enforcement can can get it later. So you are required to keep that. So do do make sure that that you look at that because under certain statutes, that's that's a required part of the process as well. Yeah, I wish I had to say it, but like if you actually get yourself in a situation you're running a, a, a server. That might be a good time to touch base with, with an attorney just to make sure for sure you don't want the it's kind of a third rail and you don't you don't want to yeah. uh, touch that very much for sure for sure the other thing on on moderation with kappa is one of the things that i that i've seen argued um i have never actually you know seen a, a situation on myself but i've seen the argument that if you're collecting ages but you're not actually you don't have a team of people to make sure that I've I've got my birthday. I put my birthday in, but you don't have someone to confirm that my birthday says I'm over 13 or to kick me out if you if you find out my birthday is over 13. Then all you've done is provide a good argument that you knew I was under 13 and you were still letting me use your site and collect my data anyway. So if you're if you're going to if you're going to do something more than just say nobody under 13 can use my site and not have it full of kitty content, then you should. No one's no one's going to use no one under thirteen can use a site. Put that on your site. Make make it clear. Make it you know, to the extent that if you do find someone, you will remove their account. But you can't let them have an account unless they confirm they are. But if you collect ages, make sure you're using those and 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 taking into account that you you are taking steps for the people who provided ages that show they're under thirteen. Yeah, I'll just uh, to do to riff on that a second. One of the ways in which people have have indeed gotten in, into trouble in this uh, area for the kids online uh, privacy is, you know, the lawyers come up with the, the terms and the privacy policy and whatnot. And they make it very clear, you know, you 13 are not allowed and da, 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 da. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that they that the people on the business side think it's great to uh, market to kids and start selling, uh, you know, advertising that is targeted kids and write things in their internal messages about how we're, we're doing this. And so, you know, I, I, this is actually good general advice as well. If you have a set of policies on your site that have been uh, you know, carefully thought through on how to minimize your liability, make sure that everyone in your organization has bought into these and understands what they are and uh, is uh, not not trying to find a way uh, around. Uh, and by the way, if, if you have questions at any time, we're you know a small group here, so people can feel free to come forward with with any uh, particular questions. Uh, but uh, may I'll shift for a second. Um, oh, we have a question. Excellent. Not so too much a question, guys. Did we pat the charity bucket today this morning? Nope. I just need one more single dollar bill, just one, and then I'll have an even number. And you uh, know we're all weird freaks, so. <laughs> Like, yeah, nope, nope. He's going to give me one dollar bill. We're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, All right. now I can't take two. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I know. But then you have a, a question. Well, I'm already up here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I run my own personal, I guess, technically private Mastodon server. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one on it. I'm the only one that, you know, probably will be on it. I mean, maybe one day if a friend said, hey, I want to try this thing out. But if it's just, me myself and I is the is the LLC still recommended? Well, well. So here's the thing I would say to that: it's not just you yourself and you, because your server is, and you're right that just having you on your own server is absolutely of no concern to anyone. You, if you're posting stuff that's problematic, you're not going to be in, you're not going to be protected by any laws. Um, the 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 issue with something like Mastodon though is the federated nature means that some content would get passed through or stored on your servers that you didn't put there. And so you still want now how 
do you form the LLC? Do you take these extra steps? Do you write the terms of service? Do you go to all those lengths to protect against that federated data? That's a personal risk decision that you make. Um, but but I just want to make sure that that you you recognize that those risks are still out there, even though you are the only person who is has any any content on this server. So it is something that you you would want to to keep in mind as you're doing that risk analysis that other people's content could end up on your instance. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I I would say like is it is it is it available for the public to see? Like they may not, if you're the only member, you can post on it, but does anyone see your post besides you? Okay, I mean, but that. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you know, uh, uh, well, whether your risk is, is large or small, it is your your risk because you're you're posting the stuff as well as hosting it. So, like the the protection of two thirty is that the poster uh, is is liable, not not the host. But if you're both, then like that doesn't help you right. very much. Uh, but but nevertheless, just something to sort of keep keep in mind is that like you know, uh, uh, if you're putting things out to the public, you may. You know, even even if you are completely lawful, like we said, like you could have DMCA takedown for something that you know you you had the right to publish and you publish it on there, but you'll still receive that in your role as the as the host, and then you'll have to deal with it. Um, but like probably your risk is is fairly low, or at least the same as that risk of putting it up on X or Facebook right. or whatever, because you're also putting it out to the world. But you know when you put things out to the world, there there is all that that set of risk, okay. and like it's unlikely that that will become a major problem uh if another question yes come on up welcome ah there we go thank you uh just a quick question so differences between servers that i host myself versus say something like Like a Discord, like um, which you know I might create for the simple hosted on one Discord. So there are different legal liabilities potentially, or a legal concept that someone else shares something that's hosted actually on like one of my servers at home. Yeah, versus on Discord. Yeah, a, a huge difference. Um, so, so, so the big, the big difference there is, uh, and I'm not sure if we got the whole thing on audio so i'll just repeat it quickly uh the question is at its core what is the distinction between hosting a server on mastodon and, and hosting a server on something like discord in in the sense of discord discord is the isp discord is the one who because you're you're providing the 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 outlet but the the at the end of the day the content is being run through Discord. So Discord is the one who would have any liability and gets these protections and has to take these actions, do the takedowns. You're, <coughs> you're stepping into the role of Discord or or Twitter or or whatever other service and becoming the ISP when you're hosting your own individual content. You're the one, you're the one hosting it, you're the equipment hosting it, you're the one controlling it. That's that's where the difference between Macedon and, and Discord would really be is that there's not that other entity to point to and say that's somebody else's problem. And so I uh, also want to hit on a an overall policy issue is doing something like running it yourself uh, has a, you know pluses and minuses. Um, but one one of the pluses is that we it moves us back to a more decentralized uh, internet. And one of the, the problems with uh, uh, social media, something like Mastodon, but also just more generally using the, the internet, is that there are sort of a, a small set of major providers where almost everything is, is hosted. They provide uh, those who wish to uh, uh, regulate, control uh, content. 
uh, a one-stop shop to to try to do it. So like you know, like go to Discord and try to uh, uh, put pressure on on Discord to do do things over a vast swath of users. So by decentralizing it and, and running your own instance of uh, say a Mastodon server in this case, um, it allows you a greater degree of control and if there's going to be a problem you know about it and it's not up to discord to decide what your fate is you get to know what your fate is the other side of it is you have to deal with your your, your fate directly right so it is it, it may be in some instances uh uh better to have discord deal with some of the things but if it is something where you have something lawful that you want to put out there and there is being pressure on uh the large service providers that uh, they don't want to host it and it becomes a problem and we've seen this sort of it's, it's called um jawboning is when uh politicians who the first amendment would not allow them to to say pass a law to say certain content is not allowed but they call up uh, uh uh, service providers and say, I really don't like this. And the service providers are like, oh yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to take that down, sir. Thank you. Uh, and so if we go to a world in this, which there are more decentralized servers and more spread out control, you know, you still have to deal with, with all the laws that we're, we're talking about today, but that is kind of a better universe for protecting uh, free expression and having it so that people can have different kinds of services that have the level of content moderation that is appropriate to their communities. Uh, and so there's a lot of benefits from doing it, but like with, with some of these and, and you have to deal. So in many cases, it is if uh, uh, there's some advantage in having a lot of small providers, but like Maybe you know, if everyone had personal instances, they'd all have to be sophisticated enough to deal with both the legal and the technical issues of running their own instance. So that that might be hard. And one of the ways in which I think the future could be better is if it was a lot easier for small providers to be able to do this in a safe, secure, lawful, like do all the things so that we had uh, a decentralized Internet. Um, just to, to get onto that for, for, for a second, way back in the day in the origins of the internet, it was extremely decentralized and there were a lot of just individual services or BBSs, people ran out of their basement and that was what, what people were connecting on. And then over the years, over the next, you know, 15, 20 years, there was a march towards a few centralized services. Now we have some that have, you know, several billion people on them. Uh, and this has not been a, a good thing. And so by, by doing it in a small sense yourselves and you, as you as well, I appreciate that you're helping re-decentralize the, uh, the internet. One more thing that I, that I think we should talk about is, is the, the state level issues. The, there's a lot of things that, that you know, a lot of what we've talked about here has been either federal or, or federally protected, but there's a lot of things that are just state level law and don't have a federal guideline rights of publicity is, that we talked about earlier is a great one but also revenge porn statutes most states 40 48 maybe 49 now have a revenge porn statute so all of these are creatures of state law though and they're all a little bit different and 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 what they affect and how they affect and whether they would affect you as an isp is going to vary depending on what state you're in and what what your state specifically would require. Um, so ultimately, what I would recommend you do if you're going to be running uh, a, a, a Mastodon instance or any other ISP type entity is to familiarize yourself with at least your state's view of publicity, privacy, um, and, and revenge porn. At the end of the day, that may not be all that applies, but but in your in your best instance, just make sure that there's not something that you as an ISP need to do to comply with those laws. If you need, if you're going to be required to take down information, or if you're going to be required to collect it or anything like that, so that's something that I would highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with in your own jurisdiction, because your jurisdiction is going to be completely different than mine or his or hers or anybody else's. Uh, to that point, quick question. How does the law apply? Does it apply to me or does it apply to where my server is hosted? So if I'm hosting a server out of my my own server that I'm hosting, but in North Carolina, but my, I'm homesteaded and I physically live in Louisiana, what do both laws apply? How does that contradict? You know, how does that work? Uh, jurisdiction. Yeah. So I. Uh, 
jurisdiction is is one of the you know issues that comes up in in the law and and where where you can be uh, sued. And there there are a number of them. So uh, I think at a minimum, uh, where you live and where you're physically hosting it probably have jurisdiction over an issue that that, that comes up with it. In some cases, uh, where the harm occurs could also have some some jurisdiction. So that would be like, for example, defamation is is uh, something that comes up online. We haven't talked about it much here. So briefly, defamation is a false uh, statement that causes harm to another, another person, uh, false and defamatory. Um, and, uh, you know, it has, of course, their First Amendment uh, uh, protection. So saying, like, I think this person is awful is an opinion that's protected. But if you say, you know, this person committed a murder yesterday and I have proof and it's actually not true, then that could be defamatory. Uh, and where that person lives, that's where they, they got harmed. So maybe that's a jurisdiction. And then actually, I'll, I'll segue for a second uh, just to, uh, uh, we were talking a lot about U.S. law, but uh also, you know, it's a big wide world out there, uh, and uh, the European Union has a number of laws that, uh, at least they claim, protect EU citizens wherever they are, so that the GDPR applies to an EU citizen when they're in the United States. Also, the GDPR applies to a U.S. person when they're in Europe. Uh, so they're, they're getting uh, uh, both ways. So there are a number of laws that claim extraterritoriality. The other flip side of that. There's the what you're going to do about it issue. So if you uh, if a jurisdiction where you don't live and don't ever intend on going uh, uh, has a, a claim against you, then, uh, well, what are, what are they going to do about it? And in some cases, there may be agreements as between two jurisdictions to enforce a, a, a rule somewhere else. I'm, I'm most familiar with this at the international level, so I'll use an example there. Uh, so... Uh, before I moved to Filecoin, I was at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and EFF had a uh, regular column in the blog, a stupid patent of the month. And sometimes people whose patents were described as the stupid patent of the month were upset about that. Uh, so, uh, so one of them uh, filed suit uh, in Australia. Uh, saying it was defamatory, uh, they were in Australia, so that's where they, they claimed the, the jurisdiction uh, for, for this. Uh, and the strategy behind that is that in uh, the Commonwealth countries like Australia, UK, Canada, and so on, uh, defamation is very different from the United States, and it requires you more. To, you know, in the US, you have to, to prove that someone said a false and defamatory thing. Uh, and there they have, they have to prove that they were saying a truthful thing, like the burden of proof shifts. There's like, they, they don't have a First Amendment. So it was, you know, uh, a harder case in Australia. But in the United States, uh, there, uh, well, there's, first of all, general issues about enforcing a judgment from another jurisdiction. But there's actually a particular law in the U.S. about uh, judgments where the conduct would have been protected by the First Amendment if it had been litigated in the United States. And you can go to a court, and you have did, to get a judgment, a uh, declaratory judgment where the court declared that if uh, this judgment came here to the United States to be enforced, it would not be enforceable because this activity was protected by the First Amendment. And then they kind of lost steam on their, their lawsuit because there was no pot of gold at the end anymore. Uh, but I guess so there's anyway, that's that's a, a an example of the what you're going to do about it problem. But yeah. <laughs> but then, yeah, actually, that that is the flip side. Right? Like if uh, if you visit uh, Australia uh, under the circumstances and, you know, the, the, the person who's mad at you knows that you're visiting Australia, like, for example, you're going uh, or, or EFF, like if you're going there to give a talk at a conference or such, you know, they might see that in the news and come to the thing and say, all right, you're, you've been served. Uh, but then again, no EFF assets were in Australia. So. Uh, but uh, yeah, so jurisdiction is, is a very uh, tough problem and you can, you may be able to, to fight it in some instances and then uh, I don't, we can't get really into all, all the aspects of it. But just one, one quick riff just for, for everyone. We haven't talked much about EU laws, but a lot of people who are doing a Mastodon thing will have an international audience and just be aware that the EU generally feels that its rules apply extraterritorially to servers overseas who are doing business and, and having Europeans 
uh, on the service. And they want the GDPR to apply and the Digital Services Act, which covers some of the, the liability issues that we've been talking about in, in the U.S. context. So one potential complication to all of this is uh, if I use a service like AWS to host a server, I might not know where the where my server that I, I am hosting yeah. physically is, may not physically be any one particular place. Um, and if I rent it anonymously, people might not know who I am, but they know who Amazon is. How does liability work in that sort of situation? So, uh, yeah, just a couple of, a couple of points on that. Uh, on the, uh, I guess I'll do the second point first. Uh, if if you don't identify yourself as doing it, right? They, but they can tell if they're sophisticated, looking at the uh, trace route or whatever it goes back to an Amazon uh, service. Then they can send it, serve a subpoena on Amazon and say, "Who's this person?" Um, in uh, U.S., there is a, a right to speak anonymously, and so actually one could challenge that subpoena for the identity and say this is actually First Amendment protected material, and so therefore uh, you are not entitled to get the answer to the subpoena. This only works if a service tells you about the subpoena. Most of the major providers do in part to an EFF pressure campaign of a, well, a reward campaign of giving them shiny gold stars if they adopted this practice. Uh, a lot of them do give notice, but not every service does. They and, and but if you know about it, you could challenge it. But otherwise, they're probably going to give up your name. And from that, someone and whatever contact information you would give them the server, and they might find out where you are for that jurisdiction. As for where the server is, they might with through uh, you know, technical means figure out where the IP address is and do some uh, you know, geolocation of the IP and, and get an idea of where that jurisdiction is or try to get that information out of out of Amazon. But you hit the, the sort of secondary question as the person who has gotten this server, it's a mystery where you're going to be liable. And in a world in which all the rules were the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, or at least you know you say, oh well. It's in the United States and it's all subject to US. But no, there's the state laws. And then of course, if it, it can be anywhere in, in the world, well, there's you know, 170 plus uh, countries out there and they, they all have their rules. So yeah, this is kind of an issue. Uh, and some services, I don't know if Amazon is one of them, but some of the smaller ones uh, either tell you where all their services are located. And in some instances you can say, well, I want the one that's in the data center in Virginia. You could pick one, but I don't think Amazon offers that, or at least not to you know casual uh, casual users. Uh, where, where I work, the Filecoin uh, has well, it's a steward for a system that has a lot of data storage providers, and the data storage providers, some of them in, have will will allow you to pick the location and sort of do that jurisdictional uh, arbitrage. And that brings us to 11. So that is the end of our, our program. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for who are watching later online. Uh, and uh, so that. yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. And and uh, we've touched on a lot of topics today. Basically, the, the, the takeaway, I think, is if you start having questions or you start getting questionable issues or you start getting subpoenas or warrants or whatever, contact an attorney and have someone explain you through the process to make sure that you keep those protections that we are trying to put for you in place. And I have swag and cards if anybody wants it. Thank you, Rick. Worst case scenario, if you did need to retain an attorney, in what specialization would you look? Well, it would depend on what you were getting. It, what, 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 I mean, if you, so if you were getting a, copyright takedowns, you'd want to find an IP lawyer. If you were getting a privacy issue, you'd want to find a privacy lawyer. Most of those are the same people, but okay. you want to make sure that the one you have is. If you have a, uh, you know, if you have a, a law enforcement question, if you've got, if you've been served with a warrant or you've got a revenge porn issue, you might want to find a, a criminal lawyer who will be able to help walk you through that process. So part of the issue is finding out what you're going to need advice on and then finding someone who can give you that good advice. Okay. Uh, one way to to get uh, referrals to attorney. So uh, EFF uh, has a set of uh, cooperating attorneys 
Uh, and so you can write to info at EFF.org, say what the issue you need some advice on is. And uh, I, where, where your jurisdiction actually is, us, us attorneys, we are uh, licensed to practice law in particular jurisdictions, but not all of them, uh, rarely. Anyway, you can get you use info at EFF.org to try and get a referral. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys.